China doesn't just own U.S. debt. They own U.S. stocks as well. Central banks receive incentives to purchase shares of stocks. Typically, what has been seen in recent years is that only select stocks have risen while others stagnate. With countries looking to alternative investments, the fear that the Fed will need to turn up the printing presses has increased. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we will discuss China dumping U.S. stocks, and we are going to talk about the deficit as well. Just wanted to note, I got this program here, which you might be able to see on the right-hand side, and basically that's going to allow me to draw on the screen should I need to at any time. will allow a more interactive experience, so here we go. China U.S. portfolio doesn't just consist of treasuries. So what we're looking at here is basically where China has been purchasing up U.S. debt. Everybody knows that. But at the same time, they've been purchasing stocks as well. So we're looking at the first line over here to gauge China's activity in the market for it's increasingly important to look beyond the treasury market. You need to not just keep those blinders on. And that's what everybody does. They just look at the treasuries and, you know, we've looked at them here, of course, but not looking at the other factors. Central banks are offered these incentive programs, and I've covered it here before, even with the commodities exchanges, where they are given these basically discounted prices, favorable terms to buy up the shares. Hey, that's a great deal. Buy up a lot of shares, because that's what central banks would do, and we'll give you a discount. And that's just the way it works. It works like that when you go to the store and buy anything else. So this is what has been supporting the markets to some degree. And moving on to the second paragraph here, the liquidation of the shares suggests China's central bank was still under pressure to raise dollars and smooth the yuan depreciation even though the treasury selling abated, including those suspected custodial accounts in Belgium, something I covered here before as well. Equities reduction reminds investors that while China's $1.4 trillion trove, it's big, no doubt, dwarfs its other foreign assets it has accumulated through the U.S. stocks. Okay, so basically what we have is China being obviously the number one purchaser of U.S. debt. We have Japan there as well, right near the top. Japan and China. But who ultimately will purchase this debt when they're basically weaning off. And who's going to purchase the stocks when real investors pull out and that deflation exists? Well, of course, we are going to have the Federal Reserve. Selling some of its equities is a reasonable way of raising the cash needed to finance the big drawdown in reserves. And we see this with corporations. It's happening as well, no doubt. All right, let's look at this next tab here as we see China switching to dumping U.S. stocks holding sank 38% to $200 billion. Now, we don't know if those numbers are true or anything, but what we see here is the peak looks like it's about, you know, just into the early 2015 where they peaked out and now has dropped considerably as you can see the line going across right here. And... That's a multi-year low. We're looking at four-year lows ultimately right there. And that should be worrisome because we had that big run-up during QE3. And now you have a little bit of an issue because ultimately, who's coming to the rescue? We have so many issues on our plate right now. And we don't foresee it to be any better. Look at what's happening in Venezuela. Look at what's happening with the elections. And there's so much turmoil. And it's continuing on and on. All right, let's look at the next tab right here as we see the deficit in the nation's broadest measure of trade increased to the highest level more than seven years. So the deficit has been expanding dramatically. What does that mean? Well, basically, countries have imports and exports, all right? So you basically say, all right, how much do I owe you? How much do you owe me? And let's call that the deficit in here. And what we have over time is a worsening condition between the U.S. and China, between the U.S. and many of its trade partners. The deficit right here, the, uh, the uh, current account trade deficit jumped 9.9% in the first quarter to $125 billion. 
It was the biggest gap since the deficit of $152 billion in 2008. Let me bring you back a bit. Now, 2008 was, as they say right here, the financial crisis. So think about this for a second as we head back into the financial crisis. I like to call the financial crisis part two because it's not the exact same that happened previously, but it's actually worse. It's everything worse because they removed all of the regulations that were put in place and now things have actually been allowed to get even worse this time. The higher deficit reflected $10 billion decline in the surplus of investment earnings that offset $2 billion decrease and it goes on and on. And essentially what I'm talking about here is just think about it when you have hundreds of billions of dollars that there's a deficit there and it's not being accounted for in the whole reality of this, of this situation that we're in. Think about what this means for countries like the US who are supposedly so rich, so wealthy. However, it's the so-called poor countries which have the surpluses. How does this happen? How does a country like China, which is supposed to be less wealthy than a country like the US, have a surplus, trade surplus with many countries, and it seems like they hold the power in their hands? We'll see where it all plays out in the future. Look at this right here. The Commerce Department is set this July to publish a stunning 2% downward revision of the GDP during the Obama administration term in office. Think about this as we have the GDP numbers, the fakest number that ever existed, and basically saying that we're going to revise it down 2%. We've seen what happens to increase GDP. And that could be you know, partly from expenditures, partly from all the exports, partly from consumption and anything else. There's different reasons why a GDP can go up or down. Now, generally, when the GDP rises, that's a good thing. However, what we saw in recent years was that there was a 5%. In one particular quarter, there was a 5% increase in the GDP. Why? Because they implemented Obamacare. So people had to spend more, but not on TVs, not on cars and on iPods and everything else. They were more indebted because of this taxation that takes place. So the reason I mention this is look at why the GDP has gone up or down. So that's my message to you for that. All right, let's look at the next article here. As you can see, more Americans in June saw the economy worsening than any time in the past two and a half years years. That's according to this right here. And you could see the expectations fell to 41. Now, I'm just going to mention something very quickly. All of these polls that they do, all of these numerical values that they give you, this is trying to make sense, trying to give you values, numerical values for people's expectations people's thoughts and feelings. But a number does not represent the true behavior of people. So take these with a grain of salt anytime you ever see these numbers as well. Look how many numbers they give me, 42, 38, 55, 74, 32. Let's just take them for what they are, okay? Moving on right here, as you look at shops in Caracas, it's uh, you know one of the uh, cities across the coast, and what has happened here in Venezuela is that with all of the panic that's been going on, with all of the riots and looting, people are now dying, people are now starving, people can't get the basic essentials. The cities have moved into chaos. It is civil unrest, it is chaos, there have been riots, there have been food riots, there have been looting, and this has now been spreading. We can see that and I've received reports from Trinidad, Tobago, how they are experiencing the backlash from that in their nation as well. So this is happening. It's spreading out geographically. That's the way it happens whenever you have an issue. For example, I always hear it all the time from Canadians that everything's just fine here. Look, it's so wonderful and everything's just great. And 
you look to who our biggest trading partner is, and that's the U.S. If the U.S. is in trouble, we are in trouble. Now, geographically, we share the same border, but also at the same time because of imports and exports. So think for a second. So Venezuela, obviously being a country hit by massive violence, keep an eye on that. And this article here, I'm not going to read it, but ultimately what we are looking at is the Brexit. The Brexit is very important. This article is a couple of days old, so it's not really valid anymore. But what I just wanted to mention was keep your eyes very closely peeled on what's happening with the Brexit. I don't know what they'll do. I think that ultimately, if they are going to actually allow it to happen, which would be, I think, just ridiculous to the you know the people that are in control to allow this to happen the only way is if they're trying to then take it flip it and roll it up into something even more dangerous so keep your eyes on that if you found this video informative please give me a thumbs up last but not least if you found the video informative you definitely will find my book the money gps even more informative and if you want to take a look at my book head over to amazon they have a look inside feature which will allow you to flip through the pages of the book and see if you like it. Take care.